break out those hi my name is tags because they're gonna be some new staff in your school buildings but they're not teachers so who is it that schools are hiring and then you know that feeling you get when you give an absolutely dynamic lesson but then everybody bombs the test how do we find out if the lesson was effective before it's too late? And then I'll be answering a subscriber question that asks, how do we find time to do accommodations and modifications and implement RTI with everything else that we have going on in the classroom? We answer all that and more on today's episode of New Teacher Big Impact, the podcast. Impact begins now. Welcome to New Teacher Big Impact, the podcast. I'm your host, former terrible teacher turned two-time teacher of the year, Daryl Williams Jr. And we're gonna dive into the warning bell, a segment where we talk about something that's going on currently in education. And one of the things that we're noticing is that actually um, hiring is increasing in schools, but maybe not in the positions that you think. So we're still seeing some staff shortages around the nation, but we are seeing an increase in some areas. So we'll dive into an article all about that. But before we dive into it, I have to let you know that this show, this season, this podcast is sponsored by Impact. And if you don't know what Impact is yet, let me just break it down for you. Uh, think about it as if Netflix <laughs> and if um, Facebook had a baby. You know, Netflix, when you go on, you can find whatever kind of show you want. If you want a drama, if you want a horror, if you want a thriller, depending on the mood that you're in, depending on what you want to watch, you can source the content for that. And then inside Facebook, you have groups like mom meetup groups and you have groups like, you know, dads who like to bake, right? All these kind of groups where you find like-minded individuals and you talk about um, affinity related topics. So if those two things were put together, we call it face flicks, right? But if they were all centered around helping you become a better teacher, we would call it impact and that's what impact is it features courses coaching and community to help you become the teacher you've always wanted to be and make the impact you've always wanted to make you can get started today by clicking the link in the description below can't wait to see you on the other side the community is us <laughs> an amazing place to be all right so let's get into this warning bell now this article came across my feed. I get the articles from um, Education Weekly. And in this one, we're talking about how the fact that teachers have, or schools are having fewer vacancies this year, but hiring is still not easy. So, so when we looked at the data from August of 2024, it shows that hiring is actually uh, on the on the up and up. You know, post pandemic, people are always talking about, you know, there are no teachers, it's hiring is rough. So there actually is a um, decrease in school vacancies more than they've been before. We're down 5% as compared to before, right? Which sounds like time for celebration. Like, man, people are coming back to work. Teachers are back in the buildings, you know, things like that. But look at the numbers. We're down from 5%, but from 79% to 74%. So 74% of public schools are still reporting that they're having difficulties hiring in one or more positions. 74%, that is, that is literally three-fourths of all the schools in the nation. So while we are seeing an increase, it's still not a super dramatic increase, and we are still are seeing a lot of vacancies. So people are wondering, why are there still so many vacancies? Why is it still that we're struggling to find teachers, we're, we're struggling to find you know, people to lead these classrooms? And the two highest cited reasons that people give as to why they can't fulfill all the positions are a lack of qualified candidates and too few candidates applying. See, if you ask me, I would think that the highest or the biggest reason for why people are not coming into education is um, the lack of salary increase due to, uh, to combat inflation, right? That's what I would think, but they're saying that the highest is lack of qualified customer or last lack of qualified applicants and that there's not a big applicant pool so that's definitely tough and challenging as we said so three-fourths of all the schools in the nation are still struggling or public schools are still struggling to fully staff their building with teachers and there are some positions that are harder to fill than others uh, growing up as a math teacher or you know teaching as a math teacher i always thought that math and sciences were the hardest to fill but it's actually showing that the hardest positions to fill right now are ell positions or english as a english language learners or english as a second language positions as well as special ed teacher positions and so now that makes me wonder if one of the reasons why that's happening is because we are seeing an increase with students with diagnosed disabilities and an increase of english language learning students so i wonder if that's just kind of a, a bad recipe in which we're seeing influx of students in this demographic, but we're seeing 
uh, we're not having we're not hiring teachers to meet that demand. So that's where we're seeing the biggest gaps is schools are saying it's the hardest to find special education teachers and um, ESL teachers, or English as a second language teachers. So I think that is obviously not good because if we're thinking about <laughs> if we're thinking about this population, um, they have a lot of needs. All students have a lot of needs, right? But as students with um, special disabilities or students with disabilities, they need you know more support. And students that are acquiring the English language, obviously, they're going to have to hop that hurdle before they can really, truly understand and grasp the content. So the fact that we don't have um, a lot of qualified applicants in these positions is alarming to me because those are students that need a lot of assistance. But there is a bright side to all of this in that there we are seeing an increase in non-teaching positions. So... You know me, I always got to go back to the data. We are seeing big employment gains in those non-teaching staff positions. So only 69% of schools had difficulty filling non-teaching positions. So that's like your eight, the, um, the, the teacher assistants, um, the classroom aides, custodial staff, transportation staff, and that's down eight from 80% last year. So it was, last year, 80% of schools were struggling to fill those positions, whereas right now we're only at 69%. So we're seeing kind of an 11% growth in that area and that could be encouraging because anybody that works inside of a school understands how much goes into actually making sure that a school runs effectively and it's not just teachers in the classroom right so the fact that these positions are being filled uh, to me is is a little bit um, exciting if you would because um because we know we need that support as well. Support is you know, is, is not just inside of the classroom. So I'm glad that we are seeing growth in that area. But, of course, we would like to see growth inside the classrooms as well, or more tremendous growth. But it does make me think. So here's, my, here's how I, I react to all of that when I think about it. It does make me think that I think we need to, at this point, look forward and not backwards. Right now, a lot of the data, all the things that we're looking at is always comparing things to pre-pandemic. So, so, you know, before pandemic, we were the numbers were not this high. There were more qualified teachers in the building. The candidate pool was greater. I get all that. But I think now at the time of recording this four years removed um, from kind of the big shutdown, I think we have to start looking at things like, man, maybe this is just the educational landscape now. Maybe we're not looking back as oh, we have to go back to how things were. Maybe we look at what we have in front of us and decide how to make adjustments to move forward. So, for example, we're noticing that some non-qualified or non-teaching position roles are easier to fill. And we're noticing that there's an increase of students with disabilities. There's an increase of students that are English language learners. But we're having a hard time finding teachers to to um, support those students. Maybe we look at a different structure in which you know, we utilize some more of those non-teaching positions for support so that the qualified teachers that we do have are freed up to just teach. I'm thinking about, I, we employed a teacher from China a couple of years ago when I was assistant principal at a particular school, we employed a teacher from China. And um, when he was taught, I spoke to him and I told him I wanted to have a podcast interview with him. Don't know if we'll ever make that happen, but um, <laughs> he was telling me about the structures of how they do school in China. And he said that they have um, a form teacher. So even, okay, so he said the teacher's job is to teach. That's the teacher's job in China. The teacher's job is to teach. And he described the classrooms and he said, you know, in the hallway, um, every classroom just had like windows that faced into the hallway. And the teacher would be inside the classroom teaching. And in the hallway, there was a form teacher who was in charge of behavior. That form teacher would stand in the hallway in between four classrooms. They can look into all four windows. And I think the form teacher had a one to 75 student ratio in which there were 75 students that they would pay attention to. But again, that's for teachers. And he would, uh, the form teacher would stand in the hallway and look into the windows. And when there was a student that was off task or doing something that they weren't supposed to do, the form teacher would go into the classroom get that student, um, assign the consequence if necessary, that, or redirect the student or remind the student what they needed to do. The form teacher would communicate with parents. The form teacher would do all the documentation, right? So he said the teacher's job was to just teach, and the form teacher's in the hallway just scanning and looking if somebody's off task, then the form teacher dealt with misbehaviors and, and off-task behaviors and things like that. The reason why I'm bringing this up is because if we're looking at the fact that, man, and, you know, this is just Daryl Williams Jr., my brain just running. If we're looking at the fact that, you know, we, we can get teachers, we can get 
non-teaching positions in the building, right? But we're struggling to get teachers. One of the reasons why we're struggling so much to get teachers is because teachers are saying, this is stressful, I can't just teach. I'm teaching and dealing with behavior and, and dealing with um, all these other stressors and things like that. But if we maybe employed some more of these non-teaching positions where they can help support with like behavior, help support with small group interventions, help support with some of these things so the teacher could just focus on teaching, and maybe it makes it a more... Um, uh, one, it makes it a role that people would want to be in more, so maybe we would see more applicants. But then also, two, we can utilize the help that we actually have or the support that we actually have, the applicants we actually have, although they may not have their teaching credentials, they can support with behavior and communicating with parents and things like that. So, I don't know, just my thought. Let me know what you think in the comment section down below. But all I know is, when you really think about it, when even even if you're in the classroom and not having to deal with behavior or anything of that nature, you still have to make sure that your lessons are powerful and that your lessons are impactful and that your lessons are um, making a difference. So how do you even know if the lesson that you are giving is effective? That's what we're diving into in the teacher toolbox today, right after this. Never underestimate your teaching. There's 1% that sets you apart from everybody else. And that 1% is how you're gonna make your impact. He was exciting, funny. He is just real. This was like monumental. If you view your 1% as if it's a deficiency, you'll operate as if it is. But if you view your 1% as if it's your amazing, you'll operate with confidence. And I need some more people as we step into this next school year to walk confidently knowing that your differences are not your deficiencies. Your differences are not your drawbacks. Your differences are not your downfalls, but when you let your differences live, that's when you can make a difference in students' lives. I can't wait to see these teachers enact their 1% amazing and make the difference that only they can. If you would like for your school district to be empowered as well, you can click the link down below and our team will reach out to you. Welcome to the Teacher Toolbox. This is the segment where I help you understand a principle that you can master in order to be a more effective teacher. And for the last couple of weeks on this podcast, we've been going through how to properly plan effective lessons. And as a reminder, this entire course lives inside of impact. So if you've been receiving value from the course, uh, if you've been seeing the, the power in understanding how to unpack the standards and how to pace out the year to make sure that you have time to teach all the content that you need, you will definitely, definitely appreciate the course inside of Impact as well as the community support where you can communicate with other like-minded individuals to help you along your educational journey. Again, Impact is in the description below. So let's recap because this is actually going to be our last time talking about how to properly plan effective lessons. And we can say that Remember, we started with the fact that standards are the foundation. Curriculum is a resource, but we're making sure that we are grounded in the foundation of standards. So we talked about how to take that standard and unpack it by looking for the verb in that standard because the verb is gonna let you know what students need to do. So when you look at the verb in that standard and you look at what it's asking you to address, then you list out everything students need to do in order to master that standard. Those are now called objectives. The objectives that students already know how to do, you leverage to help teach them the objectives that they don't know yet. And so now that you have your objectives listed out, those are now your lessons. And inside of your lessons, you're adding your own little razzle dazzle. You're hooking students, right? You're making sure that you are engaging. Uh, we talked about how to incorporate some things to make sure that they are paying attention so that they can actually receive and retain the information. And then we talked about how to properly um, pace throughout the year using the pace framework so that you make sure that you don't get to the end of the year and say, man, I didn't really get to cover that standard. Um, but you can make sure that you're prioritizing your time on the things that students actually need. And and now we're talking about, but how do you even know if the lesson was effective? All right, how do you even know if it lasts? How do I know if this was a lesson that um, worked, that if students got the information, how do I know without waiting until the end of your assessment or without waiting until the test at the end of the semester or quarter or unit? How do I know if that lesson was effective in real time or pretty quickly so that I can, I can move on to the next lesson? Well. That's actually what we're gonna dive into today. The indicators are similar to 
indicators in, in, in another world, like not in another world, it's similar to indicators in other situations. It may not be that students are coming to you and telling you, wow, thank you so much, Mr. Williams. I love that lesson. You did an amazing job. You know, I really feel like I'm better because of it and I am receiving and retaining this information. That might necessarily be the case, but there are some indicators similar to when you go to a family gathering and there's food around Right. I don't, why, I don't know why I always talk about food. I don't know why it, it just always comes up. Maybe because I record these in the morning and I haven't eaten breakfast yet and I'm, and I'm tired and I'm hungry. But <laughs> it's like when you go to a family gathering and um, there's food and then like there's like, I don't know what you guys eat in your family. But for me, it might be macaroni and cheese and, you know, some collard greens and some yams and some curry goat and some rice and peas. Mm. Sorry. So <laughs> you have all these things and they're. When something is good, oh, that, that plate is clean. It's, it's, it's clean. You may see bones depending on, <laughs> depending on how good it was. I've been in some situations where people will crack open the bone and eat the marrow. I've been in those situations. I'm not that kind of guy, but I've seen those people in those situations. Um, but then when something is not really, you know what I'm saying? I mean, something is not what you expected it to be, you might leave it on the plate. It might, it might still be sitting there. So then... As you're scanning the table and you see that, and you see that the, uh, the the collard greens are on everybody's plate. Like if, if nobody if nobody finished the collard greens, then you might you might say, man, that that one that one was not that one didn't hit. So nobody came up to you and said it didn't taste good. But there are indicators because when you looked across the table, you can see ah that's left behind. That means that they didn't like it. Those ribs though, all I see is bone. That hit right. So. How does that work in the classroom? I'm sorry, I told you, I don't know why I feel. <laughs> I'm just hungry this morning. <laughs> but the same thing works in the classroom. It may not uh, happen that students come up to you and tell you that it was great, but there are certain indicators. And here you go. An effective lesson is one that engages students, meets objectives, and produces measurable progress. So what we need to do is be able to figure out, how, did it engage students? Did it meet the objective and did it produce measurable product um, progress? So here are the questions that you can ask. Were students engaged? Did they meet the objectives? And what's the measurable progress? Those are really the three questions that you need to ask at the end of every lesson. And I'm going to break those down. But also this is broken down inside of the, the course workbook, which again lives inside of Impact. So to get access to that workbook, just check out Impact in the description below. So when you're asking yourself, were students engaged? Here's how you break it down. What worked and what didn't? So when you're looking at the lesson, what worked and what didn't? Because, man, I, I listened to this um, YouTuber that talks about productivity and he says, success leaves clues, so make part twos. What does that mean? When you do something well and it is successful, it's going to leave clues behind about what it was that made it successful. Understand what those clues are and then repeat that um, whatever it was that made it successful. Repeat that process. So success leaves clues, so make part twos. So were students engaged? What is it that they were doing? Were they actively participating? Were they paying attention? Um, what's a lesson that you did where you, or what is an activity that you did within that lesson that students were actually paying attention to? Did you use a particular um, software like a Blook It, right? That, man, when I did this, students were locked in and paying attention. Now that doesn't mean that you have to use Blook It every single day. What that means is, man, hmm, when I incorporated technology or when I used an engaging tool, students were engaged and, and participating and paying attention, maybe I should incorporate some more engaging activities like that. Again, that doesn't mean that you do Blook It every day. Maybe that means, okay, Tomorrow we'll do um, a kinesthetic four corners activity where we'll take the questions and students will get up and move around the classroom. Again, we're doing something engaging, similar to like how Blick it was. Or we'll increase with competition. I'll do this half the class versus that half the class because apparently when they were playing Blick it, they liked you know collaboration or they liked the competition. So when I'm saying success leaves clues, I'm not saying to do the same exact thing over and over and over again. I'm saying look at an activity or a portion of the lesson that was successful based on whatever it is that you're looking for, if you're looking for engagement or if you're looking for high achievement or if you're looking for students to, you know, be um, to be paying attention, whatever it is that you're you, that you're looking for, there's some level of success. So view that 
And when you see that success, you can repeat it. Success leaves clues, so make part two. And then you can also even ask students. If you are not able to see or able to tell if students were engaged, then you can ask students what was helpful or what was confusing, what would you like to see more of? You can ask students those questions, whether it's a poll um, or a little more informal where you can just ask them, but basically, get student buy-in and feedback you know about lesson and maybe not every single lesson right but just asking them hey like what are some things that you appreciate about the lesson because again you want them to be engaged and when i think about engaged i think about students that are um, actively participating so when you think about you know going to a sports game when it's a blowout game people are kind of just sitting there maybe scrolling on their phones but when there is a close game and people are standing up and cheering and clamping and stopping on the bleachers and things like that that's what i picture when i think engagement like they're they are participating they are cheering um although they're not actually on the court and playing with them they feel as if they are in the game right so that's what we're looking for with when we're talking about student engagement. Uh, we're looking for how students are participating. They're engaged when they are participating. What that looks like in your class could be actively, you know, taking notes or actively answering questions, actively doing things. Not saying they need to be stomping on the bleachers and jumping up and down in your classroom, but I'm saying that level of participation, you can tell that they are paying attention and they're locked in. So when you get that level of participation, then you want to say, you know, um, how do I repeat this to make sure that students were engaged? All right. So question number one, were students engaged? Question number two, did students meet the objective? So how do you know if students met the objective? Well, can they do the verb of the objective? Remember, the verb of the standard, we break down um, to say what we look at the verb of the standard to determine what the objectives are going to be. Now, we look at the verb of the objective and say, can students do that? Was it understand? Was it calculate? Was it predict? Was it comprehend? Was it draw? Like, what was the verb of that standard or that objective, I should say, of that lesson objective? If students can do that, then that shows that they have, um, that they have mastered it. The way that you evaluate that is with formative assessments, like we talked about maybe two episodes ago. Because through our formative assessments, like the quizzes, the exit tickets, the, you know, think pair shares, right? The whiteboard activities, um, all those formative different assessment things. When we're looking at it, we can determine if students have been, have mastered that objective. So that's another way to tell if a lesson was effective. So again, number one, were students engaged? Did you see that participation? Two, did students meet the objective as you're looking at the formative assessment data which again should be something that you look at right like soon in the real time or very soon after to determine how students um, were able to perform on that lesson when you looked at that formative assessment data did it show that students understood the objective and that they have mastered the objective if so that's two out of three two out of three on the way to becoming an effective lesson. And then last question is, what's the measurable, what's the measurable progress, right? A little tongue twister there. What's the measurable progress? Because this is the third question because now we're trying to see, are we on track to reaching our goals, okay? So when we are looking at the overall standard, when we're looking at the overall year and the things that students need to be able to achieve, when we are mastering this objective, is it getting us closer to the goal, right? Is it getting us closer to mastering the standard? What are the results of the formative assessment say? And where are we now compared to where we were or where we need to be? That is super critical because that's going to help us understand if this lesson was effective. I mean, all three of these are going to help us understand if the lesson was effective, but now we're looking at, okay, where are we now compared to where we were before or where we need to be? Because if um, maybe if they, they mastered that objective, but that objective was similar to kind of something that they've already been doing and it's not getting us closer to mastering the standard. I mean, was that an effective lesson? We got to really unpack that back to the beginning. Maybe we didn't even need to have a whole lesson on this objective, right? Because it didn't get us any closer to our goal. We're kind of at the same place. So that is very important for us to evaluate. Okay. So those three questions one more time. Those three questions one more time to determine if a lesson was effective. Were the students engaged? Did students meet the objective? And what is the measurable 
progress. When you answer those questions, you'll be able to determine if the lesson was effective in real time so that you can determine what it is that you need moving forward. All right, do I need to you know, clean this objective up before I move into the next one? Or is that next objective within reach, right? That we can just move on into the next, next lesson objective. So those are, that's how you're able to tell if this lesson was effective so that you don't now get to the end of the unit and test the entire standard and realize that you, you dropped the ball somewhere or that students don't understand this particular thing. Remember, if they didn't learn it, you didn't teach it. You may have spoken it, you may have said it, you may have talked about it, but in order for them to have learned it, um, it means that in order for you to have taught it, it means that they have learned it. And um, this is a way that you can determine if students learned or if that lesson was effective so that you can have information before you sit down again for more of a summative assessment and before it's too late and you run out of time and you can't get to all of the standards throughout the year. So that's how we're going to wrap up our conversation about how to properly plan effective lessons. And again, the full course, as well as the workbook, as well as the community support is inside of Impact. So if you are really trying to properly plan effective lessons to make sure that students receive, retain, and understand the information, Impact is where you need to be. Up next, we are going to dive into the new teacher quick tip of the week where I give you one game-changing tip that you can use and apply today to make a difference in your classroom. All right, right after this. What if I told you that the principles that are being taught in this video could be taught to your school community live and in person? Well, the answer is yes. <laughs> I'm Darrell Williams Jr. and you know that I'm on a mission to help a million students be able to live the life that they choose, not the life they're forced to settle for. And I do that by empowering new teachers to have a big impact on student achievement data without burning out, without feeling unsupported, and without changing who they are. So if there's a message that I can empower your students, your staff, your school community with, I would love to pop up in person and make that happen and provide massive value for your school community. Check the link in the description below to fill out a booking form and somebody from the team will get back to you about how we can work together. Welcome to the new teacher quick tip of the week. I'm gonna give you this one game changing strategy and people really overlook this. It's called positive narration. Why do people overlook positive narration so much? We're kinda of gonna dive into that a little bit. First of all, what even is positive narration? That is when you highlight the activity that you want to be, um, how do I say this? You, you highlight the activity that you want all the students to be doing. Because by highlighting that activity, you make it the popular decision. So now you're making the thing that you desire the most popular decision. So let me break it down and give you an example. Positive narration would be um, just for simplicity's sake, now I'm not saying that this needs to happen in your classroom, I know there's a big debate, but let's just say you want students in a single silent straight line, right? Now some people are saying we shouldn't institutionalize students and put them in a single silent straight line. Some people are saying there needs to be order and students need to be in a single silent straight line. I'm not here to debate that topic or those conversations. What I'm saying is, if that was the expectation, here was how you positively narrate. You could positively narrate by saying, all right, uh, well, this isn't a positive narration yet, but when I say go, we're going to line up and we are going to stand in a single silent straight line as we head to lunch. Go. And then as I'm watching the students get up and get into the line, then I can say, all right, Nyella's moving quietly. Joel is standing in line with a bubble in his mouth. I don't know, in my brain, I'm thinking about kindergarten and first grade. Megan is facing forward and standing in line. So that's what positive narration is. Positive narration is when you are highlighting the desired behaviors publicly because you want the behavior that you as the teacher desire to be the behavior that the students choose. So that's what positive narration is. And the reason why I say that is, is underlooked is because, or overlooked and underutilized is because so many times I go into classrooms and while I'm in those classrooms, I notice that teachers are not utilizing positive narration. They'll just say, line up, and then they'll start highlighting the negative behaviors. So they'll say, okay, uh, when I say go, uh, we're gonna stand in a single silent straight line as we transition to lunch. Go. Up, uh, Jimmy, that's not silent. Up, uh, Jason, uh, face forward, right? So now we're, we're nitpicking or we're highlighting the negative behaviors and that's where we're drawing the students' attention to. So two, a, a multitude of things are happening here. One, we're forcing the student's brain to do a whole lot of work. 
because they then now have to translate what we're saying. So if I'm highlighting Jimmy for talking at that point, Jim, uh, Jimmy, we're supposed to be silent line. Now, as another student that's listening, I'm thinking, okay, Jimmy is talking in line. That's not what she wants to do. So I should do the opposite. There's so many steps. Whereas if I highlight somebody that is doing the right thing, awesome, James for standing silently in line. Boom. James got celebrated for standing silently in line. I should stand silently in line too. It's, there's no, not no, but there's not a whole lot of steps to get there. But be, and because you highlighted James, man, you celebrated James. I want to do what James is doing so I can receive or I can get celebrated as well. You know, and no, you're not going to celebrate every single student because that would take a tremendous amount of time. But just that thought, oh, that's what you want to see. Boom. Even though you just said it. Right. Even though you just said we're going to stand in a single silent straight line. The fact that you are now publicly highlighting and celebrating students that are doing it effectively is um, allowing or forcing other students to want to do it as well. And also it's giving students a a reason to be excited because when we're highlighting students that are saying uh, we're doing the negative things, right? One of the reasons that I think people don't necessarily like or utilize positive narration as much is because, well, let me just talk about me. I know for me as a new teacher, it just felt like I was, it was gimmicky, you know? It felt like I was just, a, 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 when I first used to start doing it, I said, oh, Jimmy is standing with a bubble in his mouth. I don't know why I keep going to to, to bubble in the mouth. I never taught elementary. Okay, I'll would, I would be in seventh grade and I'll say, um, you know, um, Clarice is standing silently. James is seated with his hands on his lap. Like, I don't like, just like that. And it seemed like robotic and it seemed not natural. But what I've learned is that's because I was utilizing somebody else's strategy instead of really understanding the principle. That's why I teach principles and sometimes I share strategies. But the principle is you want to make sure that students hear the desired behavior and, and um, that that desired behavior is the most popular decision. It, it's the behavior that you want them to be able to do. So be natural. And so what it became for me it just became my natural tone. So as I was teaching um, later on in the career, after I just really understood the principle, I would say things like, man, my eighth grade classroom, I would say things like, okay, you know, it's, it's time for us to take notes. Uh, when I say go, show me that you are ready because my students knew what that would look like. All right, when I say go, show me that you are ready. All right, James is seated. All right, Maya is locked in. Cool. See you. All right. Let's get going. Right. So I would I would say things like that, which, again, were my uh, was, was my natural cadence. And I would just let them know that this is what we're doing. So let me give you an example of positive narration in my classroom, because I didn't want to sound all robotic and gimmicky and things like that. But I eventually got to the place where I just it just made sense for me. Like I just started. It became natural. And that's what I want for you, like for it to become natural. So in my eighth grade classroom, I remember getting started in class and I'll say, all right, so do now is over. We're getting into the lesson, right? I'll say, all right, time for the lesson. Um, show me that you are ready. My students knew what that meant to show me that you're ready. I say, cool. Appreciate how James is seated. I see you locked in Jeremiah and thank you for having your notes out, Caleb. All right, let's go. And I'll get started. So that's just me naturally speaking. Right. That's just really what I would say. But listen, I just I pointed out Caleb for having his notes on his desk and somebody was seated. Somebody was locked in or meaning like their eyes were paying attention on the screen. So it wasn't it wasn't robotic and unnatural for me. Thank you for being seated, silent, single and solo, having a bubble in your mouth like it. <laughs> I don't know why I keep going to bubble in the mouth, but it wasn't like robotic like that for me. Um, it, once I started doing it effectively, it was at first, but again, it just becomes a natural cadence. The principle is you just want to make sure that you are highlighting the behaviors that you want to see and other students hear that, boom, this is what the expectation is. But most importantly, be consistent because when you are consistent then students understand that this is real, this is the expectation. So just make sure that you stick with it. All right. That's uh, positive narration. I, this is one thing that I want you to try this week and comment down below to let you know, to let us know how it works. It is watch the student's eyes as you are highlighting one student and that is doing the right thing and watch how the rest of the class starts to adjust. OK, just just let me know how it goes for you. It's a complete game changer. We're transitioning now into the teacher's lounge, the teacher's lounge where we don't complain about students. We don't talk about them, but we actually find solutions. That's coming up right after this question for you. What are you doing on Tuesday night? 
The answer could be learning the game-changing formula to take control of your career without waiting on administration, without feeling unsupported, and without spending a whole lot of money. You can join us for our free workshop where we are going to unpack the 3D teacher success formula that's gonna teach you the one thing that you have to do to take control of your career and become the teacher you've always wanted to be and make the impact you've always wanted to make. It's right inside of your control. All you have to do is click the link in the description below to register for the free workshop, newteacherbigimpact.com backslash workshop, and I'll see you on Tuesday night. Here we are in the teacher's lounge, one of my favorite places to be because in this teacher's lounge, again, we don't make fun of students. We don't talk about them negatively, but we bring our problems and we find solutions. And that's what we do inside the impact community. So this message or this, um, this question was sent in by Martha. And again, if you want to submit a question, all you have to do is become a member of impact and you could just put it on the discussion board. I'll bring out the question. I'll answer it here um, on the podcast. And this question says, how do I find time to implement RTI interventions while still teaching my regular curriculum? Listen, I get this so much that teachers have to do, Martha, like there's so, 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 so much that teachers have to do. And, and now on top of that, I have to implement you know, these RTI interventions. I'm doing small groups. I'm doing pullouts. Like there's just so much that, that needs to be done. I get it. So here's what I would say. One, you want to pre-plan the interventions so that you know what it is that you are going to have to do. So that one of the reasons why people get flustered or people get stressed or people feel overwhelmed is because things are happening in real time. So it's like um, I'm teaching the lesson and after I do the, you know, I do, you do, we do. Let's just use that as an example. So I do the I do, then we do the you do. And after we do the you do, I recognize that some students are not ready for the we do. So now I have to determine, all right, I'm going to get those students and pull them to a small group's table in the back. And it's going to be these students. Oh, what are we going to work on? Okay, we work on, ah, they can't do, they can't do page 267 yet because they didn't master two. Okay, so we're going to do 265 with them. You see what I'm saying? So now in the moment, as you're thinking through all of this, it's a lot. Who's going to be in the group? What are we going to work on? What's the rest? Of the, what are the rest of the kids going to do? You know, so pre-plan what the intervention or what that accommodation is going to be, because then you can just put it into play when it's time and you're not worried about, you know, um, trying to figure it out on the spot. So as you're in the lesson planning phase, pre-plan, this is what the intervention is going to be. Or this is what the accommodations are going to be. You know, if, if we're at RTI, we just focus kind of on interventions like the small group and, and pull out. If we're talking about, you know, more IEP and um, 504 accommodation type things, you definitely have to pre-plan those. But you are also you also know which students are going to need certain modifications and accommodations. So step one is to pre-plan, you know, have an idea of what it's going to be before you even get into the lesson. And then two, it's important to make sure that you have strong management systems. So that is also a foundational piece. You have to make sure you have strong management systems because if you are one of the reasons why people are stressed out in the moment, again, is because I'm sitting at a small group table and now there's chaos going on on the rest of the class. But when you have strong management systems, you can remove yourself from for a season and sit at a small group table or work with a student one on one. And the rest of the class keeps moving as a well oiled machine when you have strong classroom management systems. If you're looking for strong classroom management systems, you can check out the course Classroom Management Made Simple, which is also inside of Impact, but that also is actually a free one. So if you click the link in the description below and you click watch a free course, the free course is Classroom Management Made Simple, where we're gonna help you find a classroom management system to keep more students in tier one of RTI and not have to move so much into the interventions and um, the small group and in, in, in one-on-one pullout by really strengthening that tier one support by having a strong classroom management system. So that's all inside of there. And then lastly, remember, you can't create time. You can only maximize it. Okay. You can't create time. You can only maximize it. So what are things that can run simultaneously? So while I'm working with this group, the other students are working on X, Y, Z. Or while I'm working whole group, the small group is working on X, Y, Z. You can't create more time. You Maybe you have a 45-minute segment. You have a 90-minute block. However much time you have, you can't create more of it. You can just maximize the time that you have. So being intentional about the time that you're having, that you're not wasting any of it, and that as you're looking at, man, I don't have, I don't have time to do small group and to accelerate you know, my, my high learners that are ready to move on. 
maybe those things can happen at the same time. While you're working on a small group, the learners that are ready to move on are working on maybe a, techno a technologically advanced you know, software that's pushing them or they're working in a workbook going a step ahead. I don't know. There's so many different options. But what I'm saying is maximize that time so that you don't, like you're not servicing or yeah, you're not servicing one group and the other group is kind of just lollygagging and, and not really doing anything, just kind of killing time, but being intentional about how you maximize the time that you're spending. And I can't help you create time, but helping you, but, but doing those three things, you can maximize the time and really make sure that you are getting the students what it is that they need. All right, man, this has been a lot of fun. So uh, let's transition to our exit ticket where as any effective lesson is going to make sure you have some formative assessments to make sure that you got it. So answer the question below. Got to make sure that you got this objective. Here's the question. What is going to be your strategy for determining if students were engaged? Right. We talked about effective lessons. Make sure that students are engaged. What's going to be your strategy to make sure that they were? How are you going to figure that out? Let us know in the comments section down below. I appreciate you being with us here today. Next week, we're going to dive into how to differentiate for a wide variety of learners. We're going to dive into what's an IEP, what's a 504, what's a, what is even RTI, right? How do we support a diverse group of learners? That's what we're picking up next week. Hope to see you there. In the meantime, share this podcast with someone who is looking for a teaching job. You know, actually, no, don't do that. Is not a large pool of people. Share with somebody who is not a teacher but is working inside of a school because we know that that number is actually going up. So thank you for being with us. Can't wait to see you on the next one and um, have an amazing week. See you soon.